how do I introduce this next uh, panelist, um, having a bit of an out-of-body experience in the years ago I'd be doing this. Um, when I say that, that Stan Persky needs no introduction, I'm not really being pretentious, I'm simply stating that he's done so many of these kinds of events that you should know who he is by now. Uh, public intellectual, um, author of so many books, um, uh, I, I like to think of the, you know, there are three, three or four phases, you know, the, the political books, the, uh, the Son of Socrat and uh, Fantasy Government series, the, um, the Boyopolis Trio, as I call it, Buddies, um, uh, Autobiography of a Tattoo, and, and then we take Berlin. And then these sort of more recent, ruminative, uh, philosophical books about uh, everything from sex to writing to um, uh, you know, uh, education and, and everything. And um, I think that's, um, that's um, he's, I'm, I'm happy to call him uh, a, a friend and mentor as well. So, Stan. First of all, this, this is hearable. Yeah. Uh, I uh, do uh, agree with and support things that Alex has said um, and the uh, position on this question of local acquisition. And echoing uh, the other uh, writers who have spoken, the distinction between the parochial and the cosmopolitan intelligence is to be able to um, appreciate the local in the context of the world. And that's why you want to have uh, librarians locally who know something so that their uh, work can be measured against the world so you end up with a cosmopolitan intelligence rather than merely a parochial one. So that's my statement of support for the, you know, the position you put forward. Um, my father, who taught me to read, um, grew up as a young adult in the 1930s, in the Great Depression of the 1930s. Um, and so the, the stories that I heard as a child, the first stories that I heard as a child, and of course, often the first stories are from your mother and your father. Some, some people um, have other sources for that. But that's, in a way, the beginning of your repertoire of stories which you will later spin out in your life. And so the first stories I heard were stories from my father about uh, traveling during hard times, during the Great Depression. And they were stories about uh, hobo jungle camps and riding the boxcars and um, the IWW, which was the International Workers of the World Organization which um, issued the silver dollar line red card by which you could ride on the railroads. And then the main story that my father told me that I recall was stories of, it was stories about how to survive in hard times. It was a very practical kind of story. And then when you were riding on the boxcars, it was very important to be prepared for the next town or city. And so what you should do is you should have a clean set of clothes on you, and then you should wear coveralls that buttoned up to the neck because you got dirty riding on the boxcars. And then when you rolled off the boxcar carefully um, and you arrived at the town, then you could un take off your coveralls and you'd be dressed in clean clothes and you'd be completely presentable for purposes of getting meals or possible work or all of that. And then what you did when you got to the city uh, or the town is you could go to the library and you could be in the, you could sit in the library all day and it was warm in the library and you could do the greatest <coughs> Thing possible, which was to read books in the library. And so my first image of the library uh, in my mind was the library as a refuge in hard times. We're still in the hard times. <laughs> I, I take it that everybody here appreciates the connection to the present. Um, 
in all of that. I'm very fond of this particular library, which was uh, made by Moishe Safdie, the architect. And when it was proposed in Vancouver, there was a lot of controversy in the architectural community. And there was a great deal of snootiness and looking down one's nose on the part of many people who didn't like it at all. But when I saw the very first picture of it in the newspaper, I thought it was terrific because Moishe Safdie understood that a library is a fantasia and this building was constructed as a fantasia and when friends and people that I know come from out of Vancouver to visit Vancouver, the one building that I take them to is to see the public library because it's such a, uh, a distinctive place. When I first um, appeared on some panel at the library, the VPL used to give you a coffee mug and on the coffee mug was an inscription and it was a famous line from the writer uh, Borges, Jorge Borges, and the line was, some, was to the effect that I have always thought of paradise as a kind of library. <laughs> to, um, since his, his name has been invoked, Alberto Mangel has a book called The Library at Night, which is a very good book about the library, and I just wanted to read this, the, um, also to add a few more lines of Alberto to the air tonight, um, and it, where he says, um, outside of theology and fantastic literature, Few can doubt that the main features of our universe are its dearth of meaning and lack of discernible purpose. And yet, with bewildering optimism, we continue to assemble whatever scraps of information we can gather in scrolls and books and computer <coughs> chips on shelf after library shelf, whether material, virtual, or otherwise, pathetically intent on lending the world a semblance of sense and order while knowing perfectly well that however much we'd like to believe the contrary, our pursuits are sadly doomed to failure. <laughs> 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 <laughs>